and welcome to Book Spot. I'm Earl Weinberg. This time we will continue our reading of Have Spacesuit Will Travel by Robert Heinlein. Kip has won a spacesuit in an advertising contest. And this book is about having a spacesuit. So you're going to hear all about spacesuits. What can you do? Well, you can't carry 50 pound blocks of ice. You get rid of heat the way you do on Earth by convection and evaporation. You keep air moving over you to evaporate sweat and cool you off. Oh, they'll learn to build spacesuits that recycle like a spaceship. But today, the practical way is to let used air escape from the suit, flushing away sweat and carbon dioxide and excess heat while wasting most of the oxygen. There are other problems. The 15 pounds per square inch around you includes three pounds of oxygen pressure. Your lungs can get along on less than half that, but only an Indian from the high Andes is likely to be comfortable on less than two pounds of oxygen pressure. Nine tenths of a pound is the limit. Any less than nine tenths of a pound won't force oxygen into the blood. And that's about the pressure at the top of Mount Everest. Most people suffer from hypoxia, oxygen shortage, long before this, so better use two PSI of oxygen. Mix an inert gas with it, because pure oxygen can cause a sore throat or make you drunk or even cause terrible cramps. Don't use nitrogen, which you've breathed all your life, because it will bubble in your blood if pressure drops and cripple you with the bends. Use helium, which doesn't. It gives you a squeaky voice, but who cares? You can die from oxygen shortage, be poisoned by too much oxygen, be crippled by nitrogen, drown in or be acid poisoned by carbon dioxide, or dehydrate and run a killing fever. When I finished reading that manual, I didn't see how anybody could stay alive anywhere, much less in a spacesuit. But a spacesuit was in front of me that had protected a man for hundreds of hours in empty space. Here is how you beat those dangers carry steel bottles on your back. They hold air, oxygen and helium, at 150 atmospheres, over 2,000 pounds per square inch. You draw from them through a reduction valve down to 150 PSI, and through still another reduction valve, a demand type, which keeps pressure in your helmet at three to five pounds per square inch, two pounds of it, oxygen. Put a silicone rubber collar around your neck and put tiny holes in it so that the pressure in the body of your suit is less. The air movement's still faster, then evaporation and cooling will be increased while the effort of bending is decreased. Add exhaust valves, one to each wrist and ankle. These have to pass water as well as gas because you may be ankle deep in sweat. The bottles are big and clumsy, weighing about 60 pounds a piece, and each holds only about five mass pounds of air, even at that enormous pressure. Instead of a month's supply, you will only have a few hours. My suit was rated at eight hours for the bottles it used to have, but you will be okay for those hours if everything works right. You can stretch time, for you don't die from overheating very fast and can stand too much carbon dioxide even longer but let your oxygen run out and you die in about seven minutes. Which gets us back to where we started. It takes oxygen to stay alive. To make darn sure that you're getting enough, your nose can't tell, you clip a little photoelectric cell to your ear and let it see the color of your blood. The redness of the blood measures the oxygen it carries. Hook this to a galvanometer. If its needle gets into the danger zone, start saying your prayers. I went to Springfield on my day off taking the suit's hose fittings and shopped. I picked up secondhand two 30-inch steel bottles from a welding shop and got myself disliked by insisting on a pressure test. I took them home on the bus, stopping at Pring's garage and arranged to buy air at 50 atmospheres. Higher pressures or oxygen or helium I could get from the Springfield airport, but I didn't need them yet. When I got home, I closed the suit, empty, and pumped it with a bicycle tire to two atmospheres, absolute or one relative, which gave me the test load of almost four to one compared with space conditions. Then I tackled the bottles. They needed to be mirror bright since you can't afford to let them pick up heat from the sun. I stripped and scraped and wire brushed and buffed and polished preparatory to nickel plating. Next morning, Oscar the Mechanical Man was limp as a pair of long johns. He leaked. Getting that old suit not just airtight, but helium tight was the worst headache. Air isn't bad, but helium is so small and agile that it migrates right through ordinary rubber, and I wanted this job to be right. 
not just good enough to perform at home, but okay for space. The gaskets were shot and there were slow leaks almost impossible to find. I had to get new silicone rubber gaskets and patching compound and tissue from Goodyear. Small town hardware stores don't handle such things. I wrote a letter explaining what I wanted and why. And they didn't even charge me. They sent me some mimeograph sheets elaborating on the manual. It still wasn't easy, but there came a day when I pumped Oscar full of pure helium at two atmospheres absolute. And a week later, he was still tight as a six ply tire. That day I wore Oscar as a self-contained environment. I had already worn him many hours without the helmet, working around the shop, handling tools while hampered by the gauntlets, getting height and size adjustments right. It was like breaking in new ice skates, and after a while I was hardly aware I had it on, once I came to supper in it. Dad said nothing, and Mother has the social restraint of an ambassador. I discovered my mistake when I picked up my napkin. Now I wasted helium to the air, mounted bottles charged with air, and suited them. Then I clamped the helmet and dogged the safety catches. Air sides softly into the helmet, its flow through the demand valve regulated by the rise and fall of my chest. I could reset it to speed up or slow down by the chin control. I did so, watching the gauge in the mirror and letting it mount until I had 20 pounds absolute inside. That gave me five pounds more than the pressure around me, which was as near as I could come to space conditions without being in space. I could feel the suit swell and the joints no longer felt loose and easy. I balanced the cycle at five pounds differential and tried to move. And almost fell over. I had to grab the workbench. Suited up with bottles on my back, I weighed more than twice what I do stripped. Besides that, although the joints were constant volume, the suit didn't work as freely under pressure. Dress yourself in heavy fishing waders, put on an overcoat and boxing gloves, and a bucket over your head, then have somebody strap two sacks of cement across your shoulders, and you will know what a space suit feels like under one gravity. But ten minutes later, I was handling myself fairly well, and in half an hour I felt as if I had worn one all my life. The distributed weight wasn't too great, and I knew it wouldn't amount to much on the moon. The joints were just a case of getting used to more effort. I had had more trouble learning to swim. It was a blistering day. I went outside and looked at the sun. The polarizer cut the glare, and I was able to look at it. I looked away, polarizing eased off, and I could see around me. I stayed cool. The air, cooled by semi-adiabatic expansion, it said in the manual, cooled my head and flowed on through the suit, washing away body heat and used air through the exhaust valves. The manual said that heating elements rarely cut in since the usual problem was to get rid of heat. I decided to get dry ice and force test a test of the thermostat and heater. I tried everything I could think of. A creek runs back of our place and beyond it is a pasture. I sloshed through the stream, lost my footing, and fell. The worst trouble was that I could never see where I was putting my feet. Once I was down, I lay there a while, half floating, but mostly covered. I didn't get wet, I didn't get hot, I didn't get cold, and my breathing was as easy as ever, even though water shimmered over my helmet. I scrambled heavily up the bank and fell again, striking my helmet against a rock. No damage. Oscar was built to take it. I pulled my knees under me, got up, and crossed the pasture, stumbling up rough ground, but not falling. There was a haystack there, and I dug into it until I was buried. Cool, fresh air. No trouble. No sweat. After three hours, I took it off. The suit had relief arrangements like any pilot's outfit, but I hadn't rigged it yet, so I had to come out before my air was gone. When I hung it on the rack I had built, I patted the shoulder yoke. Oscar, you're all right, I told it. You and I are partners. We're going places. I would have sneered at $5,000 for Oscar. While Oscar was taking his pressure tests, I worked on his electrical and electronic gear. I didn't bother with a radar target or beacon. The first is childishly simple. The second is fiendishly expensive. But I did want radio for the space operations band of the spectrum. The antenna suited only those wavelengths. I could have built an ordinary walkie-talkie and hung it outside, but I would have been kidding myself with a wrong frequency and gear that might not stand vacuum. 
Changes in pressure and temperature and humidity do funny things to electronic circuits. That is why the radio was housed inside the helmet. The manual gave circuit diagrams, so I got busy. The audio and modulating circuits were no problem, just battery-operated transistor circuitry, which I could make plenty small enough. It was a two-headed calf, each with transmitter and receiver, one centimeter wavelength for the horn and three octaves lower at eight centimeters for the spike in a harmonic relationship, one crystal controlling both. This gave more signal on broadcast and better aiming when squirting out the horn, and also meant that only part of the rig had to be switched in changing antennas. The output of a variable frequency oscillator was added to the crystal frequency in tuning the receiver. The circuitry was simple on paper. But microwave circuitry is never easy. It takes precision machining, and a slip of a tool can foul up the Im impedance and ruin a mathematically calculated re resonance. Well, I tried. Synthetic precision crystals are cheap from surplus houses, and some transistors and other components I could vandalize from my own gear, and I made it work after the fussiest pray and try again I have ever done but the Karnsine thing simply would not fit into the helmet. Call it a moral victory. I've never done better work. I finally bought one, precision made and embedded in plastic from the same firm that sold me the crystal. Like the suit it was made for, it was obsolete and I paid a price so low I merely screamed, but then I would have mortgaged my soul. I wanted that suit to work. The only thing that complicated the rest of the electrical gear was that everything had to be either fail safe or no fail. A man in a spacesuit can't pull into the next garage if something goes wrong. The stuff has to keep on working or he becomes a vital statistic. That was why the helmet had twin headlights. The second cut in if the first failed. Even the peanut lights for the dials over my head were twins. I didn't take shortcuts. Every duplicate circuit I kept duplicate and tested to make sure that automatic changeover always worked. Mr. Charton insisted on filling the manuals list on those items a uh, drugstore stocks, maltose and dextrose and amino tablets, vitamins, dexedrine, dramamine, aspirin, antibiotics, antihistamines, codeine, almost any pill a man can take to help him pass a hump that might kill him. He got Doc Kennedy to write prescriptions so that I could stock Oscar without breaking laws. When I got through, Oscar was in as good shape as he had ever been in Satellite 2. It had been more fun than the time I helped Jake Bixby turn his heap into a hot rod. But summer was ending, and it was time I pulled out of my daydream. I still did not know where I was going to school, or how, or if. I had saved money, but it wasn't nearly enough. I'd spent a little on postage and soap wrappers, but I got that back and more by one 15-minute appearance on television, and I hadn't spent a dime on girls since March. Too busy. Oscar cost surprisingly little. Repairing Oscar had been mostly sweat and screwdriver. Seven dollars out of every ten I had earned was sitting in the money basket. But it wasn't enough. I realized glumly that I was going to have to sell Oscar to get through the first semester. But how would I get through the rest of the year? Joe Valiant, the all-American boy, always shows up on campus with 50 cents and a heart of gold, then in the last chapter is tapped for the frat and has money in the bank. But I wasn't Joe Valiant, not by eight decimal places. Did it make sense to start if I was going to have to drop out about Christmas? Wouldn't it be smarter to stay out a year and get acquainted with a pick and shovel? Did I have a choice? The only school I was sure of was State U, and there was a row about professors being fired and talk that State U might lose its accredited standing. Wouldn't it be comical to spend years slaving for a degree and have it be worthless because your school wasn't recognized? State U wasn't better than a B school in engineering even before this fracas. Rensselaer and Caltech turned me down the same day, one with a printed form, the other with a polite letter saying it was impossible to accept all qualified candidates. Little things were starting to get my goat, too. The only virtue of that television show was the 50 bucks. A person looks foolish wearing a space suit in a television studio, and our announcer milked it for laughs, wrapping the helmet and asking me if I was still in there. Very funny. 
He asked me what I wanted with a space suit, and when I tried to answer, he switched off the mic in my suit and patched in a tape with nonsense about space pirates and flying saucers. Half the people in town thought it was my voice. It wouldn't have been hard to live down if Ace Quiggle hadn't turned up. He had been missing all summer, in jail maybe. But the day after the show, he took a seat in the fountain, stared at me, and said in a loud whisper, Say, ain't you the famous space pirate and television star? I said, what'll you have, Ace? Gosh, could I have your autograph? I ain't never seen a real live space pirate before. Give me your order, Ace, or let someone else use that stool. The chalk malt, Commodore, and leave out the soap. Ace's wit went on every time he showed up. It was a dreadfully hot summer and easy to get temporary. The Friday before Labor Day weekend, the store's cooling system went sour. We couldn't get a repairman, and I spent three bad hours fixing it, ruining my second best pants and getting myself reeking. I was back at the fountain and wishing I could go home for a bath when Ace swaggered in, greeting me loudly with, Why, if it isn't Commander Comet, the scourge of the spaceways. Where's your blaster gun, Commander? Ain't you afraid the Galactic Emperor will make you stay in after school for running around bare naked? A couple of the girls at the fountain giggled. Lay off, Ace, I said wearily. It's a hot day. That's why you're not wearing your rubber underwear? The girls giggled again. Ace smirked. He went on, Junior, seeing you've got that clown suit, why don't you put it to work? Run an ad in the clarion, have space suit, will travel, or you could hire out as a scarecrow. The girls snickered. I counted ten, then again in Spanish and in Latin, and said tensely, Ace, just tell me what you'll have. My usual, and snap it up, I've got a date on Mars. Mr. Charton came out from behind his counter, sat down, and asked me to mix him a lime cooler, so I served him first. It stopped the flow of wit and probably saved Ace's life. The boss and I were alone shortly after. He said quietly, Kip, a reverence for life does not require a man to respect nature's obvious mistakes. Sir, you need not serve Quiggle again. I don't want his trade. Oh, I don't mind. He's harmless. I wonder how harmless such people are. To what extent civilization is retarded by the laughing jackasses, the empty-minded belittlers? Go home. You'll want to make an early start tomorrow. I had been invited by the Lake of the Forest for the long Labor Day weekend by Jack Bixby's parents. I wanted to go not only to get away from the heat, but also to chew things over with Jake. But I answered, Shucks, Mr. Charton, I ought not to leave you stuffed. The town will be deserted over the holiday. I may not open the fountain. Enjoy yourself. This summer has worn you a bit fine, Kip. I let myself be persuaded, but I stayed until closing and swept up. Then I walked home doing some hard thinking. The party was over, and it was time to put away my toys. Even the village halfwit knew I had no sensible excuse to have a space suit. Not that I cared what Ace thought but I did have no use for it, and I needed money. Even if Stanford and MIT and Carnegie and the rest turned me down, I was going to start this semester. State U wasn't the best, but neither was I, and I had learned that more depended on the student than on the school. Mother had gone to bed and Dad was reading. I said hello and went to the barn, intending to strip my gear off Oscar, pack him into his case, address it, and in the morning phone the express office to pick it up. He'd be gone before I was back from the lake of the forest, quick and clean. He was hanging on his rack, and it seemed to me that he grinned hello. Nonsense, of course. I went over and patted his shoulder. Well, old fellow, you've been a real chum, and it's been nice knowing you. See you on the moon, I hope. But Oscar wasn't going to the moon. Oscar was going to Akron, Ohio to uh, salvage. They were going to unscrew parts they could use and throw the rest of him on the junk pile. My mouth felt dry. It's okay, pal, Oscar answered. See that? Out of my own silly head. Oscar didn't really speak. I'd let my imagination run wild too long. So I quit patting him, hauled the crate out, took a wrench from his belt, and removed the gas bottles. I stopped. 
Both bottles were charged, one with oxygen, one with oxyhelium. I had wasted money to do so because I wanted just once to try a spaceman's mix. The batteries were fresh and power packs were charged. Oscar, I said softly, we're going to take a last walk together, okay? Swell. I made it a dress rehearsal. Water in the drinking tank, pill dispensers loaded, first aid kit inside, vacuum proof duplicate, I hoped it was vacuum proof, in an outside pocket, all tools on belt, all lanyards tied so the tools wouldn't float away in free fall, everything. Then I heated up a circuit that the FCC would have squelched had they noticed, a radio link I had salvaged off my effort to build a radio for Oscar and had modified as a test rig for Oscar's ears and to let me check the aiming of the directional antenna. It was hooked in with an echo circuit that would answer back if I called it, a thing I had breadboarded out of an old Webcore wire recorder, vintage 1950. Then I climbed into Oscar and buttoned up. Tight? Tight. I glanced at the reflecting dials, noticed the blood color readings, reduced pressure until o Oscar almost collapsed. At nearly sea level pressure, I was in no danger from hypoxia. The trick was to avoid too much oxygen. We started to leave when I remembered something. Just a second, Oscar. I wrote a note to my folks, telling them that I was going to get up early and catch the first bus to the lake. I could write while suited now. I could even thread a needle. I stuck the note under the kitchen door. Then we crossed the creek into the pasture. I didn't stumble in waiting. I was used to Oscar now, sure-footed as a goat. Out in the field, I keyed my walkie-talkie and said, June bug calling Pee Wee, come in Pee Wee. Seconds later, my recorded voice came back. June bug calling Pee Wee, come in Pee Wee. I shifted to the horn antenna and tried again. It wasn't easy to aim in the dark, but it was okay. Then I shifted back to spike antenna and went on calling Pee Wee while moving across the pasture and pretending I was on Venus and had to stay in touch with base because it was unknown terrain and unbreathable atmosphere. Everything worked perfectly, and if it had been Venus, I would have been all right. Two lights moved across the southern sky, planes, I thought, or maybe helis, just the sort of thing yokels like to report as flying saucers. I watched them, then moved behind a little rise that would tend to spoil the reception and called Pee Wee. Pee Wee answered, and I shut up. It gets dull talking to an idiot circuit which can only echo what you say. Then I heard... Pee-wee to Junebug, answer! I thought I had been monitored and was in trouble. Then I decided some ham had picked me up. Junebug here, I read you, who are you? The test rig echoed my words. Then the new voice shrilled, Pee-wee here, home me in! This was silly, but I found myself saying, Junebug to Pee-wee, shift to directional frequency at one centimeter and keep talking, keep talking. I shifted to the horn antenna. Junebug, I read you, fix me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You're due south of me about 40 degrees. Who are you? It must be one of those lights. It had to be. But I didn't have time to figure it out. A spaceship almost landed on me. And we'll find out how things go on from there next time.